things that skeptics like you're talking about might be able to like see, oh, wait, arts can do this, arts can do that. And it's getting at like equity issues, things like that. So, but I, I definitely, we've encountered that as well, that it's like this nice kind of fluffy thing, but like, what does it really add? Um, so hopefully we'll be able to help give you guys some tools today to kind of address some of that. A um, couple other things that I'm seeing, community needs to have a safe space to engage in art through small workshops. Do you wanna say anything more about that, Yoko? It's okay if not. Um, yeah, okay. I, I'm yeah. right here. <laughs> um, it, I think the flexibility in, in our programming had, had uh, a great impact in that way in that um, I had this um, quilt exhibit that I wanted to push to make it sound like like a kind of like a higher end of quilt or creative side of quilts. And there was a lot of pushback in, in saying that, you know, quilting is in this area. I'm from Kentucky. I'm, I'm in Hindman, Kentucky in the Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Kentucky. Anyway, so it's like, well, quilts are, you know, to, to keep you warm and nothing else. and. Um, so then uh, it kind of opened up a whole spectrum of conversation without being um, challenging at all. Um, and it became kind of like a, an opportunity to talk about some of these things. And the exhibition happened and people wanted to quilt more. Um, and so then these little workshops that, that we made with a really safe amount of people with social distancing and you know COVID measures and uh, people really are searching for somewhere that they can go and get out of the house um, and actually do something different um, and learn something, um, which was very inspiring to me. So thanks. That's, and I love, I'm very familiar with Eastern Kentucky and you probably know Robert Guy, maybe, <laughs> Yoko. <laughs> but um, it's a great, I think that's a great example. I think workshops, and I'll talk a little bit about that too but especially during COVID have been an important part of how we've actually interacted and helped people process things. Um, I see some other exciting things from Margie who's here in Cincinnati. Um, her friend hosted a planning session in her backyard with fire pits, fairy lights. So simple things like that can be super inspiring. Um, sounds like Heidi sees some of the same kind of skepticism as well. And I'm, my guess is probably others of you do as well. Does anyone wanna share anything else before we go to the poll question? I'll give you one minute and pop in. No? Okay. So, and at the end, there'll be some time as well. So something might come up for you. So Gally's gonna put up, we have a quick pop-up poll question um, about how COVID has impacted your creative placemaking project. And then we'll do that. We'll kind of then share what everyone says. And I think you can choose as many that are applicable. Okay. I'm gonna let's close that poll. Ten seconds, and then we'll share out the results. I think Gally will, um, there should be a screen that'll pop up. Is, oh, there we go. Okay, well, wow, zero, no impact, which I guess I shouldn't be surprised about, but you never know. Um, so 94%, that's pretty significant that you guys have had to change programming. Um, and that can be really tricky to do that pivot. But I think one of the things about arts um, and you as artists or working with artists is you're creative, you're able to do that. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we pivoted later, but um, it's actually been an opportunity for us that things have looked different for us. I answered yes on this as well. Um, fortunately only 18, I mean, I should say only 18, but it, I thought it actually might be higher. Just have lost funding or match. 
same with partners. Um, exciting that there's been some new partners found um, and even some access to new money. Um, okay, that is helpful. So it sounds like everyone's changed programming and we'll, we'll get into that um, in a little bit. So kind of leaping off of that, this, this you can put in the chat or you can pop out. I want you guys to um, talk about what has been your most important fundraise or what currently is your most important fundraising or financial question right now. And you can even say programmatic question if you want, because a lot of times that ties together. And if you want, just put that in the chat. We can look at this. I'll give you a couple minutes. So again, just to reiterate, what is your most important fundraising or financial question right now? And it could be related to programming, staffing, et cetera. You guys have about three or four minutes to do. I'm just gonna jump in for one little housekeeping thing. If you're actually a resource member that's on this call, could you put a little asterisk at the front of your name? Um, because we're gonna do some breakout groups and uh, it will just help Gally, our tech, figure out where to put people. So if you're a resource team member um, or a staff person, could you put a little asterisk in front of your name? Thanks. I would say too, maybe here too, is if there's things that have had to change for you, can you just, maybe you can add that as well, because that'll help. Kind of, and that'll help guide as I go into our power, the PowerPoint presentation guide, kind of how I talk about things. And if you don't feel comfortable sharing, that's fine. I, I totally understand that as well, but. Okay, so funding, why are looking here? So funding, wider rollout across region. So that's, yeah, requiring significant funding. So that's talking about scaling, partnerships, 17 municipalities, that's a lot of municipalities. Um, so we will definitely, we can talk about that. Operational funds, huge, because you guys are probably finding out. Um, that a lot of times grants don't want to fund operations. So that'll be a thing that they say we'll fund everything but operations. Although I was very encouraged to see that the NEA is having, um, allowing you guys to change some of that to general operating. I think that's pretty exciting. Um, challenges in fundraising for climate related disasters. Yep. And, and hope, I'm hoping I think the arts can have a lot to say in that. And so I'm hoping that we're gonna talk about intersections of like arts and health and economic development, things like that. And I think that's a point where we can kind of think through some of that. Um, and let's see, give you guys one or two more minutes to add anything that you wanna add. This is some good helpful stuff for me to look at. I'm just looking at, oops. Okay, so Heidi's asking, how do we alter what partners could do prior to the pandemic to what they're able to do now? Um, Heidi, can you, do, can you describe that just a little bit more? Just flesh that out verbally for a minute. She hear me. More difficult for us to work in developing Partnerships alter their priorities to serve basic needs. That's something we have seen a ton. Um, we got some funding pulled because of that, because they were pivoting, which is completely understandable. But I think hopefully today we can think through some of that because the arts can address a lot of these things too. How can we shift the conversation? Okay, so how are you saying how can we shift the conversation knowing that there's an economic change? Um, Right, and when you say economic change, meaning just whether people have jobs, et cetera, is that what you're referring to? I'm kind of thinking of partnerships and smaller organizations in a small town. Like if there's a shift uh -huh. in their reality, mm -hmm. um, 
is the expectations, should they still be the same? And sh how do we have those conversations? Got it. Okay. Helpful. Super helpful. Okay. Anyone else want to add anything? This is all really good stuff. And I will give you guys one more minute and then we'll keep going. Challenges around stability of community partner organizations. That is a really good one. Um, found it useful to begin asking what are challenges and brainstorming ways of addressing. Reveals the fact that most of the challenges have no readily available ways to address, which ends up sometimes increasing the viability of an arts-based approach, which originally that was seen as ridiculous. I think that's a good point. I think some of what Yoko was talking about before with the quilting and people just wanting to get out workshops. Okay. I wasn't that into the arts before, but this is a safe way of doing something small. And I think something we found in workshops, this is just a quick anecdote, is that we had to pivot a lot of our work to um, workshops, some online, but some when we were able to do it outside, we could do it. And people just, as they're making art together, they could process things together. Just that healing aspect of art has been really powerful. Um, versus, yeah, right. Uh, right. Good, Maggie, saying <laughs> the value of arts and culture versus kind of diverse immediate needs for underserved. So those are all things. So I think that this is helpful for me too. I think I think we're going to definitely address some of these things and give you guys some tools to hopefully move forward with some of this. Um, so we're going to stop that for now. And obviously, feel free to add things as you think of them. Um, and then I am going to start sharing my screen. One second. Okay. So there we go. I think this, Lynn, was this in Providence, this picture? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think I was like, I think this is a picture from Lynn, a ribbon cutting. <laughs> this is where you want to get. That's the exciting part of the ribbon cutting when people are all together and could be, I don't know, six inches from each other, cutting a ribbon. Um, okay. So let me, hold on one second. For some reason, there we go. All right. So First, I want to start off with talking about kind of meeting your funders' expectations. So I'm thinking about current funders, but this will be future funders too. I think as you're finding with NEA, and we found this recently too, is um, funders are becoming much more of a partner. And I think you really want to look at them as a partner, um, that they're in this with you. That does, it, that's not to say I totally get, like, especially, you know, you think NEA, for example, a federal um, it's a federal bureau and like how do I talk to people there and fortunately you have great people there that have been really open and I think what you'll find this isn't the case in every single let's say foundation etc there you're always going to run into someone that's not as open to kind of being that partner but I think that's really shifting and I think and so here are some ways that you can really help foster that as a partnership so looking at yourself as how because I think you really want to bring your funder on as a partner and that um for numerous reasons, but one is, as you know, and th this work is about relationships. And when you have good relationships with people, they're that much more willing to want to, what's the next project? What's the next? I mean, that doesn't always work that way, but they're much more willing to help you. And so here's some just kind of easy-ish ways to do. It's just a good to be reminded of. Recognition, I, I think Catherine talked about this, you know, in the NEA, um, or the r -Town grant, you have to formally recognize but you should be doing that anyway. So make sure that, I mean, just simple things of just putting the logo on things, um, tagging people when you're putting posts on social media, um, those, those go a long way. And, and actually like social media is a really low hanging fruit for that. So make sure you like that organization. Um, so I'll use Kresge Foundation as a great example. They're very good about sharing things on Facebook. So we tag them and then they'll reshare what we're doing. So those are just kind of simple, low hanging fruit things. And it, it reminds them who you are, especially like a bigger national funder, like, oh yeah, here's what they're doing. And also just, it's it's a goodwill thing and just something good to do. Um, and that kind of ties along with respect too and really um, communicating with your funder. I We always um, kind of err on the side of sharing too much, too many photos, too many, too much. They can choose, pick and choose what they want to read. Um, now, I don't, that doesn't mean you kind of send them something necessarily every week. You want to be strategic in it, but you also don't want to, um, it, you'll find this with, and depending, we're going to go into who your different funders are, but traditionally a lot of funders specifically around like foundations, you know, they may have a portfolio of 30 organizations and they can't get to everyone and they're a national foundation or 30 to 60, let's say. 
a whereas you may have a local foundation that is much more kind of approachable on a day to day. So you just kind of have to tailor it to what they want. It might be even something you can ask them say, hey, I want to share this with you. Is that OK? Because you obviously there can be information overload, but it's just something to think about. And thinking about your role as a partner, their role kind of ties into that kind of, I mean, these all kind of go together is that relationships. Um, one thing we often do as well, we um, have uh, we have a local foundation who really wanted to talk to someone at Kresge Foundation. And Kresge had said, hey, you know, we would like to support your work in whatever way we can. We said, well, we have a local foundation that really wants to talk to you guys. So we were able to kind of broker that relationship. So things like that go a long way as well. And then results, and this is just a reminder, picture, especially with the arts and people, as many pictures as you can, just document the, as much as you can, over-document. And so that you have a, a treasure trove of things to pull from when it's time for you to kind of report back to your funder or for those new grant applications, you have, a, sometimes they won't ask for attachments, but a lot of times they do. So the more that you have, the easier it is. So, cause you can recycle some of these things, right? For sure. Um, okay, next slide. So what are some types of funders that might come on as new partners? So I want you guys to think about, and we'll talk a little bit about this and Catherine went through, it, it helped me to understand where you guys all are and you're, you know, you've, are in the midst, most of you, I don't think that I could be wrong on this, someone may have finished their project already, but most are in the midst or kind of wrapping it up. Um, and so you're either stopping, you know, this Our Town project is a standalone project, but hopefully what we'll talk about today is how can you leverage whether you make what your Our Town project is now into something bigger. So someone mentioned kind of making it more regional. How do you do that? Who, what new partners do you need to bring in? Or how can you leverage that amazing, successful our town project that you did and do something else. Because a lot of times, most times, especially for a funder that might not know you, they want to see what you've done before. So if you can leverage and talk about in a way, especially if there's that skepticism that I think Mark talked about, you know, and others have experienced is you want to show the impact. You want to be able to, and so we'll talk about some intersections and, and ways to get to funders that might not be traditional funders that you would think of. So we're going to talk about different government funders cultural organizations, local corporate sponsors, and intermediaries, which I'll talk about more what that is, but that LISC is an example of that where Lynn um, works, and then tourism agencies. So, so next slide. So for traditional arts funders, and I will say this, like I think most of you know this, but with the NEA, there's different um, pools of funding you guys can go under. And so like, for instance, I have worked with our town funding, but we as an organization have never gotten our received our town funding and um, but our municipality has so i've been a part of that. But we have gotten artworks funding um, and so but for you guys, not all of you are necessarily arts related organizations so some of these might not be your traditional arts funder or funders that you always work with, but in general, this is when you think of traditional arts funders there's local and state arts councils that I think are everywhere, at least at the very least there's state art councils. A lot of people rely on the individual donors and memberships. And these are all things, I'm putting these up there to just kind of think about um, the more, we'll get into the more non-traditional ways, but these are, I, I, want, I don't wanna say low hanging fruit because it's not that they're easy, but they're things where you can go to first. Um, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, which, so you guys are in our town. I don't know if anyone here has gotten any other, is it Challenge America, right? And um, Artworks. So like, for instance, when we go under the artworks, there's different, um, there's like folk arts, there's different divisions. We, because we're a community development corporation and our work is creative placemaking, we typically do um, all, it, we're under design usually. So, but there's different, depending on what your project is, you can submit under different categories. Um, and then local national foundations and local corporate sponsors. So like, for instance, we have Proger here. So we're trying, actually currently they have a foundation well they're food related and so and you i'm not going to get into kind of definitions of creative placemaking because i think you guys have talked about that but we use food a lot as a tool for a lot of the work we do um, in our creative placemaking work and so we right now are trying to foster this relationship with kroger it's not we traditionally have not have many corporate sponsors or if any it's been like really small so that's new for us i'm learning a lot from that because we had to do a presentation to them and 
doing a presentation to a corporation, I've always been in the nonprofit world and boy, they move at a different pace. There's just a different, I, I learned a lot just from even doing that. So if you have a corporate sponsor and you ever want to chat through how that goes, I, I think I've learned some stuff from that and could give you some tips. Um, I can't see the chat. So if anyone is putting a chat in or asking me questions, I'm going to say to Gally, is there a way that I can see that on my screen? Hold on, maybe I figured it out. It can pipe up, Sarah, and let you know if something's coming okay, in. Okay, that'd be super helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and again, yeah, feel free to pause and ask questions. This is fairly informal. Um, let me just do a quick time check. Is it 2.15? Sorry, hold on. Okay. All right, I'm going to get... So, Thinking beyond non-traditional, or sorry, traditional funders, what are some points of intersection? This kind of is going to start getting into some of the stuff you guys are talking about. Specifically, again, going back to what Mark said about the arts, how, okay, that's fine, or, but, you know, especially now with COVID and everything feeling so kind of precarious, um, I, we believe, and I think most of our, um, the resource team believes here that there's a lot of intersection. Arts can really help to make your project just that much stronger. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, darn it. I knew I was, okay, there we go. So for instance, and so thinking about, so in our breakout groups, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but when I talk about intersection with different things, I'm talking about things like health, housing, economic development. So there was a paper that was a white paper and I can share it later. I actually found it yesterday and I forgot to send it. So I'll send it later. But it, it kind of went through some of these things. It was talking specifically about housing and how arts can enhance around kind of affordable housing issues. So thinking, and here's some things they pulled out. And I thought these were super helpful. This, by the way, is a picture of Helmand Creative Center, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but this was one of the workshops we did during COVID. I was mentioning we did some workshops. And this particular workshop was a short, we had one of our artists, and I, we have artist studios here. And one of our artists led a workshop on shrines and how shrines help people process kind of trauma in a neighborhood or you know throughout the world. And so she was able to, so everyone made their own personal shrine. And then we did a big community shrine that we had a local metal worker make. So getting to that thing of how do you articulate often invisible challenges? Um, the arts are really amazing at doing that, whether it's poverty, child poverty issues. I mean, there's just myriads of examples that you guys will see and probably are doing yourself um, and, and kind of getting to that trauma. And that ties in the workshop I was talking about is nourishing communities who may have experienced trauma. Um, and, you know, there's a whole, it's not that new now, but trauma informed community development is like, how do you, like, I know in Philadelphia where I used to work, the organization I used to work for, New Kensington Community Development Corporation, they, they have now trained everyone in trauma-informed kind of outreach and community development. And that's new. That was not happening. But they've also used the arts to kind of organize around that. Um, and then that ties into, yeah, how do you organize around community issues? I think, yes, the events like doing an event is fine in and of itself an arts event, but for us, we really see it as a way to kind of engage people. We are neighborhood based. We are trying to build civic leadership. So yeah, the event itself is important and we really care about the art and supporting artists, but it also allows an easy way for us to meet new people. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about this. Here's just another example is generate economic development. It can be a real like Hellman Creative Center. I'll do it when I talk about it later in our case study generates revenue for our organization. And so I saw there was someone that talked about earned income has gone down. So like if you are doing shows, et cetera, you can't do those as much right now, but there's other ways to kind of earn revenue as well as an organization and help to grow arts related businesses. So let me go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna kind of, oh, I'm okay. I'm gonna kind of go through these. So now we're getting to some of the different, I won't go in depth of all these, but I did want to highlight, and I don't know if Margie wants to say anything about this, but um, NACEDA, which stands for, is it the national, what's, what does it stand for? Margie, can you help me? Their NACEDA website, their creative placemaking resources. It's the National Association of Community Economic Development. Wait, sorry. Right. <laughs> I don't <remember. laughs> Sorry. We'll, we'll share the link with you. Yeah, so the link is up there too. So creativeplacemakingresources.org. So this really, this grew out of, and I'm, I was highlighting, I was calling out Margie because she worked on this 
project or is familiar with it, um, and some of you might have been on, they did a call, a webinar a few, um, a month or so ago, because they just rolled it out. But it's looking at how do you take some of these federal government resources and apply them to the arts. So I'm just going to highlight a few here. We're not going to go, these are, would get way into the weeds if I went into these, but this is more just to start you guys hearing some of the language. Low income housing tax credits, just quick example. I use those in Philly because we did, a, and if you know um, our place out in Minneapolis, they use them a lot. So to do artist-based housing. And that kind of ties into historic new market tax credits. The big new one, which we don't know what that's going to look like, uh, as we heard uh, NEA say, the American Relief Package funds, they're going to the NEA. But beyond the NEA, there will be other funds going to local municipalities in your, some of your cities and states. So be on the lookout for that. And let's hopefully what we're talking about today will help you figure out how to access some of those, not just through the NEA. Um, there's Brownfield funds. That's the EPA. So those are funds we've used. We've turned uh, things that uh, lots that had a lot of contamination. We were able to get funds to clean those up, make them into a sculpture park. So there's an example of that. Small business development grant, um, grants. So if you're working with artists who are small businesses, you can tap into some of that. And then for those of you who are in rural, the USDA. Now, I will say I have not worked much with uh, the USDA because I've never been in a rural setting. However, I have worked in eastern Kentucky, and I know, um, and Yoka can probably speak about this, but there's specific funds, and I know others of you are in rural settings as well, that you can tap into through USDA, actually Worm Farm has used them a lot out of um, Minnesota. I think they've used USDA funds. So something to look into and just keep on your radar. So this, I'm gonna really go through quick. State government sources, this kind of, a lot of this, I, I wanna point out state legislative grants. There's, we have not done this, but there's a lot of things where you can lobby. If you have good relationships, so actually I keep talking about Minnesota, but in Minneapolis, there's a group out of Minneapolis that has really built, and, and you know, they're a pretty progressive state, but they have built at the state level, they've been able to get some legislation passed that really focuses on some of the arts related work um, through a community development lens, creative placemaking. So if you have those, they actually ended up hiring a lobbyist. Now, I don't, I hardly know of any community development organizations that have done this, but I was pretty inspired by it. They hired a lobbyist to kind of help them lobby for new legislation. So just another, kind of creative way of doing that. I won't go into all these because we're kind of behind on time. This I do want to highlight. So your local government, hopefully most of you have good relationships or a relationship with your local, whether it's whether you're, it's your county government or whatever you're sit in our case, it's usually our city government, but our county as well. Um, intermediaries. So an intermediary is someone like LISC who is um, typically is helping to funnel in a way. I think this is the best way to explain it. Lynn can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, they are focused on working with people doing community development and they can help fund and funnel some money through them. They're almost like a pass through, but they also, but they're much more than that because they give technical assistance, et cetera. An example, something that LISC did was a revolving loan fund. They're in New York City Inclusive Creative Economy Fund, which was a fund, I don't know if it's still around or not, but that they use to help fund CDCs like us that are trying to develop um, arts related, whether it's studios, businesses, et cetera. So it's just something that you might not know of. And it's another place to think about. I um, wanna say, oh, go ahead. Sarah, it's Lynn, I'll just jump in there. I mean, I think when you're talking about the intermediaries, it's important to point out that a lot of the, the funding that intermediaries have is really for development and for buildings yeah. um, and, and low, it's lending. Whereas the, that first bucket of things, community development block grant, um, working with your DPW, your parks department, your planning department, there might be more programmatic yeah, um, sure. money available, particularly with community development block grant. Um, there's, um, uh, you know, it, that's mostly available in urban areas. It's it, it, it's it has different strings attached to it, depending on the local government gets to sort of set how that money gets deployed. So it's oftentimes you have to like talk to your city council person or get in the mayor's budget for community development block grant. So it's, it's worth looking into in your local community. A lot of folks don't understand that they can actually use it for arts uh, work. Um, oftentimes, and generally community development block grant is broken into um, programmatic or um, uh, capital. So. The programmatic money can often be used as a match to some of the projects you're working on. So anyway, sorry, I just wanted to jump in on that one. <laughs> no, no, that's super helpful. And Lynn has a lot of experience in city government. So just 
it, this is more just to open your guys' eyes to different possibilities. So, and like with tourism agencies, I think that's a good example of programmatic stuff you don't know, but like we sometimes work with our pr tourism agency because they were wanting to pr promote this bourbon trail. So we took bourbon barrels. We, we weren't even the main person that ran this, but we worked with artists and they painted these bourbon barrels at what, where the new bourbon trail is, but the tourism agency funded that. So just different ways to think about kind of how you can get your projects funded. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And then lending, so this is more, and some of this really does tie into, and I won't go into details with this, although the last two I'm gonna talk about more. Community Reinvestment Act, these are working with your banks, loans. These are more like real estate related, but I don't, I want you guys to not preclude, like I'll talk about Hellman and what we did here is it's been such a catalyst for all our programmatic work that we've done, but we had to do real estate and you can always partner with a, if, if real estate feels intimidating to you and it's not for everyone, but there's always ways to partner with kind of other developers that can help you. And then because you're a nonprofit, you can tap into some of these different things. I did wanna highlight the last two bullets and then I'm gonna stop and we're gonna break out. Um, the social enterprise, you might hear that kicked around a lot. That really is, I'll give you our specific example right now is Hellman Creative Center. We have eight artist studios here and we also rent out office space. And so the, our CDC developed this building and we um, have our offices here, but in order to help sustain the operations of the building and some of the programs we wanna do, we charge rent and we get rent from that. And so we really view this as a social enterprise. So it's like basically a business that um, has a social mission and so don't be scared if you're a nonprofit, you can make money, but it has to be funneled back towards your mission. So I just wanna say that as well. And then the last thing is this, um, I don't know if anyone's used crowdsource funding, Kiva, Kickstarter, IOB. I'm gonna specifically highlight IOB because they've been a good partner. Um, and it's kind of like that old passing the hat, what used to happen is just a way to get people in your community, usually in your community, but it can be broader than that to, um, get some flexible unrestricted funding. I think most of you probably know what unrestricted funding is, but it's basically no strings attached. I mean, relatively in the sense of like, yes, you can use it for operating support, et cetera. It's much more flexible. Um, some things too, it can really help with getting your donor base out. And I, what I love is that, I mean, I, we haven't really used it much, but I know other smaller groups have. This is really good for like small, I think where I've seen it is from small one-off project, projects that either you wanna do as an organization, or let's say you're working with an artist or another um, resident who wants to do something in their community. It might be like a thousand dollar project. They don't know how to get it done. They can go on IOB because IOB gives you a lot of technical support too. And, and it, you can, it's a great way to engage your community, but also to test out new ideas. I think it's also really great for that as well. So I would highly encourage you to look at IOB. Uh, Kiva is good too, but it's more for small businesses. So as I'm thinking about what you guys are doing, probably IOB makes more sense. Um, let me make sure I don't have one more slide before we get into breakout room. Nope, okay. So what we're gonna do now, I think we'll, since we're, I went a little bit over, we'll, um, I think if we can just do 10 minutes in a breakout room and what, here's what you guys are gonna do. And so I'm gonna pop in and out of the breakout room, but this is hopefully a chance for those of you who don't wanna speak up in front of the whole group and feel more comfortable in a smaller group to kind of talk. You'll, there'll be about four to five people in each group. Um, what I want you guys to share is the current state of your project in terms of fundraising or next steps, where you are with things. And here's some questions. And I think they'll hopefully, um, will be in the chat or I can put them in the chat if not, is. Do you guys kind of thinking about what we've talked about and just I did a quick overview of different ways to start looking at funding. Do you guys see whether it's in what I've talked about or, or something else you've learned recently opportunities for bringing in new money to make your project bigger or deeper, more impactful. If you finished your Artem project, is there a way you can use your success to grow another creative place, place making project, whether it's making it that project more regional or a totally new project and then also thinking about we talked about this intersection of community development, health sector, housing, economic development. Do you see any potential there for intersection with how you're approaching creative placemaking in your project? So hopefully um, that gives you enough to kind of talk about for 10 minutes and then we'll do a little bit of share out and then um, yeah, so 10 minutes you'll be put in a room and then I will be in each room to just answer any questions or help you think through stuff. All right.
but it sounded like you guys, the rooms I was in, sound like you guys were having some good conversations and it sounds like Lynn's observ observation is a lot of projects have kind of stalled or need to kind of get going again. Lynn, I don't know if you wanna say anything else what you were just saying. No, I just, I, what I wanted to say is that like, you know, when um, everyone, it sounds, it sounds like we're hearing this a lot that everyone's projects have sort of had to stall or their community engagement strategies have had to change. Um, that, that certain things, that there's a lot of partners that aren't able to pay attention to the work. And I wanna just sort of like pause for a second there and say, you know, we're at a moment in time where we can actually start to see the light at the end of the tunnel here a little bit. We know it's not gonna go back to normal anytime soon, but it's it's gonna get a little more normal in the fall. And I think that in this, in this moment in time from now until then, or until the summer, you're all in positions where you're working on these really dynamic, incredible projects with the community and you know who the partners need to be. You've already started working with some of those partners. So see it as a moment to really lay those strong foundations and that groundwork so that when the money does start to flow into some of the agencies you're working with, like the tourism agencies, like the cities, you're already like you're already doing the work right now to be primed to be able to say, here's the project you need to fund give us more money for this, this tour or this, this festival or this um, you know, public art project because we're all teed up, we're ready to go, everything's moving, we just need you know, more support. So that's all I was gonna say is like, if, if, if you think about it that way, it's- Yeah, you know, no, I think that's a good, and that's why we kind of started with the relationship piece, like how important that is. And to, this is a time, you know, actually Zoom meetings, one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings aren't too bad. You know, people have more time, so in some ways, it's easier to schedule like I actually have got I, anecdotally I feel like we were really wanting to build our relationship with the city we got a new newish mayor right before the pandemic we were trying to shift and they got a lot of new people on staff and so I've been doing a lot of and my other staff have been doing a lot of meetings one-on-one -on -one, just getting to know them and I, I really am encouraged by the way our relationship is we are really trying to position ourselves I mean we have to be partners with them anyway but because they, the other day they floated, they might get, I don't know if they will, but like 34 million from the rescue package. What are they gonna do with that? Now, some of it has to go to specific things, but if they really see us as a partner, which they do, we are one of the first people they're gonna go to to figure out how to get some of the stuff out there. So I think just kind of reiterating what Lynn is saying, this is a time for relationship building and you can still, I've been surprised how much you can build relationships on Zoom specifically with more like, um, funders and stuff, because like the, I will say again, Anna Jolie, that the hardest thing for us and our work has been interacting with the community. So like Zoom meetings definitely aren't as effective in general. I mean, some are, but with the community, it, you need a lot more one-on-one. -on -one. And so really use this time to do kind of what Lynn is talking about, because I do think in the fall, well, the money's already approved and in the fall is when it's going to start rolling out. So um, I think you should feel positive about that and feel good about that. And I think the fact that they put money into the NEA um, is indicative that there is a need. People see that the arts specifically have been really hurt with, a, you know, I don't know how many of you are working with kind of performance arts, but those in particular have been really hurt. And so I think there's an acknowledgement of that. And maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm being pie in the sky here, but maybe people not having had some of this art for the last year or so or really seeing the value of it. And so maybe they won't be as skeptical <laughs> moving forward. I mean, who's to say, but that's my hope with all of this. Um, does anyone else wanna share out before I'm gonna do kind of, I'm gonna talk about how we leverage one of our projects to hopefully give you like a concrete example, but we can also spend some time if you guys have questions or anything that came out of your groups that you guys wanna um, lift up or talk about. You can do that now, either in the chat or verbally. And also just a reminder that myself and other resource team members can help you think through different ways to kind of grow some of these partnerships as well, if you think of something later on as well. No, no shares right now? Okay. I am going to then share my screen. Um, oops, let me get on the right. Sorry about that. Let's just do one second.
Well, for some reason, I'm having trouble making it full screen, but I'm going to go. Can you just go down to that little thing again, Sarah? That's what I thought. Which one is it? Was that it one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. So real quick, because I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but the Centers Community Development Corporation, and we've been doing this since 1976. So, and you can see I'm highlighting these different areas that we work in. So I will, even though creative placemaking is one of the areas we work in, I will say it's our approach to everything. So in some ways we've actually talked about recently taking away, because my background's economic development, really real estate and economic development, but we incorporate our approach of using the arts into everything that we do, whether it's health, financial well-being. We, oh, so I'll give you a great example right now. Um, we prepare a thousand low to moderate income taxes um, a year. And so this year we have one of our artists. So the way we're doing it is people have to stay in their car. They drop it off. We have tax lawyers on staff. They drop off all their information. Then while they do their taxes, they wait in the car. Um, so our artist has come up with these and it was her idea totally. She's like, I see all these people waiting. She made these little kits um, for them to make small sculptures in their car. So we have all these people now making these small sculptures in their car while they're just waiting in their car. And it's really amazing. And then they'll share them and I've just been so encouraged. And so that's just a small example of that intersection of arts and financial well-being, taxes. Um, so this is a quick example. I'm not going to go into all this, but I want you guys, this is a, a neighborhood we work in in the West Side, just to show you kind of, you'll see the Ohio River in the North there. And I'm going to kind of quickly go through this. But this is, I'm going to highlight, if you can see what I'm pointing to right now, this is a specific example of how we took a project and leveraged it into lots of other things. So this is Shotgun Row, you see right here. Um, basically, it, they, they, if you'd seen them before, they looked like trailers. Um, people were living outside in tents. They couldn't even live in the houses. It was the worst block in our neighborhood. We responded in the 2012 to um, Kresge Foundation who said they really wanted to look at art, that intersection of arts and housing so we had, we knew this West Side community and that there were already a lot of um, some of these things that you see here that really set the stage for, we really believe that these could be affordable housing for artists in the community. And so there's six of them, actually, you can't see all of them. We've won awards for these. Um, they have been transformed into six artists of workspace, actually five. The one was a, a residence that had lived there for 25 years and wanted to stay in their house and we wanted them to stay. And um, so they just got a outside facade treatment. So it looks like all the same, but I'm showing you this project because this was a housing, a real estate development project we used next to it. You can't see it, but the um, EPA grant that I talked to you about for the, where we cleaned up a contaminated site and turned it into a sculpture garden, that's adjacent to this. So we were able to use this project to get that EPA grant. So they were okay with us paying, like the only thing we couldn't pay for was some like plantings or something, but they did all the cleanup, which is expensive. It was this blighted lot. And we were able to use this, we call it shotgun row project to get this other EPA money. And this is just some quick stats. I, I'm actually gonna skip through this because I know we're running out of time. What I wanna show you, what I wanna talk about specifically is Hellman Creative Center and how we leveraged this to do so many other things. So we got an NEA grant. You can see this um, building right here. Old lumber mill used to be the main um, kind of place that employed people, made all the church pews, all the wood trim, everything in our neighborhood. Well, it got, it was set vacant for many, many years. It, you can see what it looked like. Um, we were able to, we knew there are a lot of artists that were, we'd already done this work with Shotgun Row. We knew the Cresby Foundation liked what we did. So talking about relationships and leveraging that. And they said, what else is there in your community? How do we continue to use the arts in this community? So we were able to get money and to redo this building, but we were able to figure out what to do with the building using artists. And I'll show you some quick examples. This is what it looked like beforehand inside. So we kept a lot of the equipment. So here's an example. So we wanted people to be excited about this project, but we were still raising money. And so one of the ways that we wanted to raise money and get awareness is we held, we worked with a local kind of a local um, jazz band and had an opening so people could see what the building looked like beforehand. And you can see here, there's old pictures. We also showed what we thought it could be. And we had over a thousand people come through that night. 
And so, and we had artists that were doing artwork and it was just a really great way for us to gather. And we also were able to gather community input there. So here's something where this is like, you might not have done real estate development, but we're really bringing in the arts to do this real estate development and to try to raise more awareness in the um, showing how arts can be transformative. Um, I'm kind of going, I, this is, I'm gonna go super quick through. So this just shows you different ways we got, this a $2 million project we were able to get this grant from the Kresge Foundation, but then we also did donations. You can see that we got historic tax credits. We even took on debt. So that's all get, I'm not gonna get in the weeds there. I'm just showing you that as an example of a way you can take some of the work we are already doing with artists and grow into this huge project. And that took, you know, that took three to four years or it can take even more. It's not a quick thing, but you can keep having these, you can leverage a lot with the work you're doing. And this is what it looks like now. We have eight artist studios. We have our offices. And so here's what I wanna to highlight to you. So this is what we leveraged. We leveraged, so now we have eight businesses that are growing. They're all arts related businesses. And actually during the pandemic, most of them actually hired on new staff. So we have um, a wig maker. We have, the, their businesses grew and I work with each of them to try to figure out how to grow their business even more. Cause that's really an economic development piece but part of them being in the building. And so they have to engage with the community in some way. So I give you that example of Charlotte who brought out the art packets. We didn't, we don't like hold their hand and say, you have to do this. We just say, we really, we have community groups coming here all the time. Your studios are here, but we don't want you to just be in your studio. We want you to help the other programmatic stuff that we're doing. So they have really embraced that and done it in so many different ways. I could talk about it, but that's just one specific example that happened just in the last two weeks was with the taxes. This is one of our studios. We have conference rooms. So, P so the community rents them out, et cetera. I'm gonna kind of end with this because this is an NEA related grant. I know we're almost out of time. So we got a series of three grants we built. So like they were saying, when you go in for NEA grants for if you wanted to go in for additional funding, it has to be a different project. That does not mean that you can't build on some of the work that you've already done, right? So this is Hellman Creative Center. When we opened, we started, the community wanted festivals. And so we got a grant from the NEA Artworks design um, category to help the community help imagine what could happen in this lot to make it more than just a parking lot. Cause right now, well, you'll see what it looks like right now. We mostly have, well, we either have events there or people park there. And so it was just a grassy dirt lot. And so we got, that was the first grant we got. Then we leveraged that grant and got a subsequent grant to do kind of inside artwork, which I don't think I have a picture of, but like we hired an artist to do installations in Hellman. And then this latest one that we just got, well, it was like two years ago is, this is a fence. So we were able to work with the community. We had a local metal worker make this art fence. You can only see one side. I think I don't have both sides. Yeah. So it's actually a triptych. So on the other side, there's another three murals um, and they're all made by two different artists in the community and then they will change every year. And so just, and that was an NEA grant as well. And so I'm using that as an example to just show you that your project can leverage so many other things. It's a ton of work, but there's a lot of different ways that your project can go. And so just thinking about it in a creative way, I wanted to use that as an example. So I'm gonna stop because we only have about five minutes. And so I want to, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of now, if anyone has any questions or wants to add anything from what we've talked about today, um, you, we have about five minutes or so to do that and get in any reactions or any, anything you really want to say. <laughs> Did you guys get anything out of today? Did you guys learn some new language, some ways of talking about um, or thinking about different kinds of funding? You can do thumbs up, you can, I mean, yeah. And what's something, how about this too? Is there something we didn't talk about that you thought, mm, I wish we had talked about that? Because that's helpful to know too. Yep, social justice element. What is, I can't read the rest of yours. Oh, yeah. When the project's over, how do you think about me? That is actually really good. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. 
So we have a number of public art pieces now that we have to do an inventory of or are building. So like when we did Hellman Creative Center, we do, we build in, because we get rent, we build in a maintenance fund. But for our public artwork, that's a great question. And I, I don't know if Margie has any answers to this, she might, but I think it is um, a hard thing to do, especially if you're doing public art. And that's something that the city, if one trick that we've done is, if we, a lot of times city will have like little pockets of land, like those weird triangles or whatever. If you can get something on the city owned land, um, it depends on your city. Often they will help with maintenance with that. So that's just it's one way to think about like, you guys could maybe help get it funded and do that call to artists, et cetera, but maybe they're willing to help because it's adding value to the city if it's done correctly, right? Like if it's a nice long standing piece, but that's a good question. It's not easy. And it's something that people don't often think about because I've definitely seen a lot of public art that just doesn't look good after, you know, the community group is maybe done and hasn't thought about the upkeep. So thank you for raising that. And definitely you need to think about that. Oh, sounds like there's someone here that can help with maintenance plans, Sally Ann. That's good to know. It's for its cancel. Any other last minute comments or questions? And I love to always hear about what you guys are doing too. And I am definitely, oh, there's, okay. So I'm definitely available um, to think through anything we talked about today, new partnerships, things like that. Um, one thing I mentioned, I just wanna say this is one of the breakout rooms was asking about how do we get like with national foundations to understand the value of arts in this intersection with health, et cetera. So I would say really look at someone, I keep talking about Kresge, but there's other organizations too, but they're the ones I'm most familiar with that already have like an arts focus there, but they're also focusing on other things, right? Equity, racial justice, housing. And they really, they're really good about looking at this intersection of we got a grant looking at food and arts and creative placemaking. And so there are some places doing that, but definitely, I think a place to start is those organizations or foundations that are already thinking about the arts. They might be thinking about the arts in a more traditional way, but because they're thinking of these other things as well, whether it's youth development, et cetera, I think it's easier to make the case because they already have arts in their kind of mission, if that makes sense. So I think we're at time, pretty much. And thank you guys for taking, I know it's a lot. I threw a lot at you guys. There's, I could talk about this forever. And I, and I want to hear more. I didn't get to hear about everyone's projects. So I'm excited to kind of, um, yeah, to kind of hear as the year progresses what you guys come up with. Because it's, I always learn something from everyone. I will jump in and just say that um, just a reminder to those of you who uh, have been participating in the TA program that the resource team members, including Sarah, are available for individual consultations. Um, and so um, if you want to talk to Sarah for a longer period of time, you can reach out directly to her and schedule a time to be in touch with her. Um, and for those of you who are new to this, um, kind of coming into the fold on the TA program, we have 15 resource team members um, that are available to share their expertise and give you advice in a confidential one-on-one -on -one or with your entire team um, to really think through issues you might be having in your project. So, just remember those folks are available on an ongoing basis. Um, and with that, I will say thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, at 3.30, we have our last session of the day, which will wrap up at about 4.45 with Marty Pottinger. Um, it's five to 150 ways to work with city government. It's, it's gonna be really fun. And Marty's been working with city government as an artist for a very long time and has a, an incredibly um, earnest and uh, joyful way of approaching the work and really learning how to appreciate um, everyone that's in the fold in terms of the project. So I really encourage you to come to Marty's session. It's gonna be a great way to end the day and hope to see you all there in about half an hour. Thanks. And thank you, Sarah, for a wonderful, yeah, wonderful session. Thanks everyone. <laughs>